That's too much. Jason and Mike are going to talk about are better predictors of the time. If you, you know, when, what time to trade a stock, what time to go into the market. They do a much better job. And, but why learn about fundamental analysis in schools? You know, many of you, many of us are you know, graduates of, of business schools. And that's the most of the, the curriculum is about fundamental analysis. Why do we still learn about it? So we're going to come to that in just a minute. And the second one is this, the fallacy that a good company is a good investment. This, this happens quite a bit. You know, people talk about, people like to talk about financial markets. We talk about Google, we talk about you know, Apple. But are they necessarily, you know, those are great companies. But are they a good investment? It depends on the timing. So again, going back to the timing that Jason you know, do, uh, do a better job predicting. And is it luck or skill? Right? Going back to that example of, of just statistics. And statistically, you're going to have people in the market that can consistently outperform the market. But is that really luck or skill? So however, you know, why are we learning? You know, why, why do we even talk about that? Why is that still important? I think it goes back to my training days. Uh, there, you know, this, this one professor I made, his name is Asworth Demoter, is an NYU professor. And people ask him, right, if, if these models we make uh, in fundamental analysis are poor predictors, and we never get anything right, we talk about, well, my firm, right, Fact Forward Research, we're an equity research firm. But we, I always tell people, well, we get it wrong all the time, and everybody gets it wrong all the time. But that's not the point. The point is having the exercise, having it. And so for him, he, he said to, to the, to the audience of, that, that he was training is that I'd rather be 15% correct than to have 0%. So whatever we're doing, it is our best estimate, it's our best guess. So we're making a good effort, in, whether intellectually or, or you know, in the aim of making money, it's still doing something that we know that we're probably going to be pretty much wrong all the time, but at least 15% of that, there's some truth behind it. So that is the, the foundation. And even if fundamental analysis is fundamentally cannot be a good predictor of the timing of your stock, it's, it's the fundamentals of companies and businesses or investments are still very important when you're making technical analysis, which Jason will talk in great length of, of that, um, yeah, how, how, to, how to look at a, a company and what you pick. The fundamentals of a business is still very important. And secondly, uh, I think fundamentals is important to me personally, is that you can never go against fundamentals so my, one of my favorite people in the world is, is Warren Buffett. And he said, only when the tide goes, you know, this is a very famous quote, right? Only when the tide goes out, do you discover who's, who's, uh, who's been swimming naked. So essentially, that's, to, to me, he was more talking about the financial crisis, you know, the banks, the certain banks that are bad, you see it during the bad times. But apply that to our, our scenario. I can interpret it as, as if, if you go against the fundamentals, you say you buy a stock, and the fundamentals, right, the sales of, are bad, right, no, no sales, or the cash position is bad, heavily leveraged, uh, you know, things like that that are, that what we learn in business school are bad companies. But the stock is going up, and you wonder, well, if it's going up, is it a good investment? Yes, yeah, you, know, you made some money. But that, it doesn't mean in the long term that you will, you know, so you can never go against the, the fundamentals in the long term. Just like if a company is growing at 200%, 300%, that's probably not going to last forever if the GDP growth of the overall market, you talk about on average, how much should the company grow. So you, you know, fundamentals are important in the long term that you can never go against it. It's sort of like going against gravity. At some point, you have to cut down. And even if fundamentals, as we call the fundamental analysis, is probably mostly flawed, it's still important to, it's still important because we as, you know, that's the economic principle behind how things work. And that's how, Individual investors which are still facing their, facing their, unless we have you know a, a crystal ball and we can see the future, we still need some form of analysis, whether it's technical, or fundamental, and because that's a predictor that people use, and securities market are you know the prices fluctuate by supply and demand. So if that is true, then this is still relevant because people rightfully or wrongfully are you still using it as the same predictor. To, to predict the, the future performance, then the stock price has something to do with fundamentals. So we'll go in the, what is you know, fundamental analysis? Really, it's two parts that I'm going to cover. One is relative valuation, so talking about the methods. And the other portion is, is kind of a discounted you know, cash flow model. And we'll talk about the relative analysis portion. and some basic concepts. And I know, you know some, maybe half of you have financial background, but I still hear this a lot from um, people even with you know, finance degrees. And so one thing is, it's, it's wrong to, to say 
that a hundred stocks. So, so I, I hear this all the time, right? Maybe less so now that people are more sophisticated. That if you talk about a stock has ten ten dollars and another stock has a hundred dollars, people will be like, oh, that stock's trading at a hundred dollars. So, well, it's great. That must be a really good stock. Well, that that's flawed because you don't know what's the basis, right? A, a stock could be, you know, Warren Buffett. I don't know. Is it like three hundred thousand dollars a share? But it, that doesn't mean anything unless you know what you're buying. Not not the company, not which company, but what are you buying? So we. We uh, intuitively we know when we're buying, you know, going out grocery shopping, buying tomatoes, buying apples. We know what we're buying because we were asked. If I, if I tell you, you know, oh, I I bought ten dollars worth of tomatoes. Somebody goes, oh, I bought a hundred dollars worth. You got a better deal. Well, you're going to ask, you know, how much of tomatoes did you buy? Right? So same thing. We know when we go shopping, buying goods is you know two ninety nine a pound. So that's how we assess whether if somebody quotes you, you know, three ninety nine, you're going to say, okay, is it? Is it organic tomato? And is it better? So you're going to do these assessments. But coming I mean, financial securities, we tend to lose that. Maybe we're not confident enough saying, okay, these are logical questions to ask. And we don't ask those questions because, oh, well, I don't really know about the financial markets. I, I think that's probably what's going on in, in most people's minds when they, have, when they make this mistake. So if you talk about, you know, this, so what are you buying when you're buying a stock, right? The most common, I'm not saying that this is you know, the only way to look at it, but in a company, a company has earnings, has cash, has revenues, has EBITDA, which is a, you know, treat that as a, as a cash proxy. And a lot of the times, the, you, you'll hear this in the financial market over 20 times PE, right, price earnings ratio. What is that? So one view is that when you buy the shares of a company, you're, you're entitled legally to a, a share of their earnings. So when you're buying a stock, the price is actually, you're buying so say that you know, the stock is worth twenty dollars, right? You're, you're, you're buying twenty dollars worth of their earnings. So that's one way of looking at it, because the earnings gets dividend now to, to shareholders. So twenty times PE is really looking at how cheap or how expensive is the price of the stock. So in the relative terms, that's why this is called relative analysis. So after this, then, then you can say, okay, if I when I go out and buy cherries and tomatoes. I know how to ask. I, I ask how much price it is, but I know what's, what's underneath, right? So it's a pound of cherries, and I know it's organic, or certain attributes of, of the stock, in this case, right? Certain attributes of the, the thing you're buying. So when you're buying a stock, you need to know the attributes of the company. You also need to know, you know how much you're paying for a, a dollar of, say, say earnings, right? How much you, you or a dollar of cash that's coming. So there are three steps to doing relative analysis. One is uh, you have to forecast, you know, so make some, some kind of judgment. So different from technical analysis, which is saying, okay, we only care about looking at the market, right, how, how that movement. Fundamental analysis is saying, okay, let's look into the company on a standalone basis first in taking a view of how the company is going to do in the future. Because remember from our previous slide, you're buying some kind of earning, right? You're buying some kind of cash. So what is the future performance of the company say, in terms of cash or revenue or, or net income? Uh, which is earnings. So here you see this is uh, this is produced by our firm for one of the companies. This, this is saying, okay, uh, this is just the output, right? So what we do in the end, we build a model and say, okay, we take certain assumptions, we forecast it. So that's so here we're not going to go into the details, but I'm just saying you need to have some kind of view. Now that view comes from a few things. You can do your own forecast, take your own view, saying, okay, I think next quarter, and then people do this all the time, right? Think about. Uh, Apple and the, it's the new iPhone 5, 5S. Saying, okay, how much sales are you going to make? How, much, how many phones are you going to make? Are uh, going to sell next quarter? And then you take a view and say, okay, I, I think they're going to do this and do that. And from all the way from the top, all the way to the end, to net income or circle, that's how much you think their earnings are going to be for the next few periods. So you take your own view. Now, the other thing is big companies like uh, an Apple or medium sized companies, they always get management guidance. So the management has a view of how, how well they're going to perform. So Apple will tell you, well, we think the shipment next month is going to be good. So they, I don't know if Apple will really use guidance, but most companies would get guidance. So use that as a benchmark because management has more information than we do. So that's something you can gauge at what the future performance is going to be like. And the other thing is come to you know, equity research analysts like us or you know, CIBC or any other major brokers. They will have equity research analysts that have their own view. So you can take an average of that and say, okay, you know, I think this is the, what the company is going to do. And so remember this number, 14.6, and we're back to 0 0.9. This is per share value. So, so, so on the per share basis, remember, you, know, you don't care a, a 
basket of tomatoes if you don't know how many tomatoes are there. So you need to know for each one how much is that going to cost you. So on a per share basis, that's the EPS. Now on the net income, that's the gross basis. So, okay, the whole company is going to earn that much. So if the market capitalization, which is the value of the whole company, is worth a certain amount, then that's the amount of net income generated. Okay, is that value, is that relative value, make, does that make sense? So that's step one is forecasting, just knowing what's going on in the company. And two is, is the benchmark, is you need to compare it to something. So in our you know, app, apples and tomatoes example, you're going to the market and you're saying, okay, let's go to the, uh, uh, the, the street market and let's go to Whole Foods and compare the prices. Right? Of course, it's different prices, because people, they're different things. And here it's really saying, okay, go to the market, and the company we're, you know, the company we're forecasting is this is a, a technology equipment manufacturing industry is that. So these are their peers. So companies that do similar things, and they are they have research coverage. So these are saying, okay, on the average, what is their their multiples? Remember the twenty times PE right, that, that we talked about. So each company would have an average uh, ratio of its own. So just the, the, this method is saying the step two is saying. If you take a look at the peers, so people that are comparable. So if you're buying tomatoes, you're going to say, okay, I, I want the same, similar type, right? If, if, if that's a very you know, heirloom tomato, that's the only one out there in the area of Vancouver, you can't really just compare that one thing and say that's the value, right? You want to do some comparison. So you can go to well, say, okay, well, some other kind of tomato, because tomato is a tomato, but they're different. So you're saying, okay, that's different. And I know uh, the, the processing the you know, method for that other tomato is a bit harder, so I think it should be more expensive. And the other one is more mass market, so it's, it's less expensive. So on that relative basis, you have a sense of what the market is like. And same thing with stocks. So if you're saying, okay, this company, you know, the third one, uh, it's, uh, it's a bad one because there's no value for it. So look at you know, this one. It's 19.9, .9, and the other one is 13 point something. So, so you're saying, okay, one is more expensive than the other. Right? So it doesn't mean it's, the stock is more, so it just means they're trading at a higher value. So there, there's probably a reason that the companies, maybe one is performing better than the other in terms of growth. But this is just really taking a broad view. We're not going to go into the details, but it's just to show you that this is how people look at valuation, right? how things are valued. And the third step is putting that all together. So you have some form of forecasting, this is step one. Right? You know what, how it's going to do. And you know what kind of value is out there, an average value of the market. So this is taking the assumption that, okay, if, absent, if I don't tell you how much those heirloom tomatoes are going to cost, and I tell you, oh, give me a price, name your price on it, what, what do you think is the fair value? Right? If I quote, you know, say five dollars a pound, you don't really know how much. So you go out and compare all of the tomatoes out there, and you take an average. And you say, okay, on the average, the different types are about you know three dollars. So I think when you sell it to me for five, it's too expensive. So the same exercise. So here you say. Okay, on average, these companies that are comparable are trading at 19.2. So if, if I want to buy our company, right, how much should I pay for it? Well, it's very easy. So you take that net income, right, and you multiply it by this value, the average, and you'll get a, a value, a, a, a sense that you think is, is, is a fair value from the average of the market. So here is putting it all together. Right? So it's 20 times, times the net income, you'll get the market value. Because net income is how much that company is going to earn, so the market value is how much the whole company is going to earn. You can also do it on a per share basis, which you know, we analysts in, in the street likes to do it, EPS, the earnings per share, so everything is on a per share basis. It's just the same thing. The top and the bottom, the only difference is the number of shares. So divided by the number of shares from the top, you get the bottom. So, the, so how do you make an investment decision business? So you do your own work, right? you get this $18 per share from your own views. And then you say, okay, today's price is at eight dollars. So I think, you know, I think it's worth much more. So then you buy the stock. If it's the reverse, you, you sell the stock. You sell short. So that's it's very simple from a relative perspective. But there are certain flaws in this this method. Uh, one is, you know, putting into trading is, is very simple. But uh, yeah, the, the flaw in this method is that why should the stock trade at the pure average? And I'm telling you, it's, a, it's an organic heirloom, or maybe I grow it in my backyard with you know everything's all controlled environment. That, in theory, should be traded more expensively. I should be able to sell for, for higher, right? So that's not to say, use this approach. You're taking the market. Why should I, as a company, or why should this company be traded at the average? It probably should be. So you should take, probably take your own view and say, okay, 
it could be, so, so, so with the step two, you're saying, okay, that's the average, but I think it could be a little higher. So people do this all the time, right? We, when we value as research analysts, we say, okay, we take it up, up a notch, it's like, this, this is a growth company, so it should be traded at a higher multiple, right? A higher price, a higher worth. So that's one. And two is, is sort of garbage in, garbage out. Because remember this, this phase two, you're taking a street consensus, right? This is what the analysts on the streets are saying their, their value is. It's not really what they are, because these are forward looking. So you, these are, they're using the future, what they predict in the future. Well, this is old because we did this two years ago. But you know, just, just so you know, it's, it's, about, it's always forward looking. So, and so is forecasting. So if what you're using here is your estimate, and then what you're using here is estimate from somebody, there, there's no way. So that's what I'm saying with fundamental analysis. It's a good proxy. The, the idea, the theory behind it is, is sound, but in practice, it doesn't quite work, right? Because it's, it's, it's taking assumptions. It's, there's a lot of assumptions, and also you're more making forecasts on forecasts. So, so that, that's, that's one thing that, uh, so, so basically the key takeaway is, is what is really driving it. That's gonna become important when, you, when we go into the technical analysis portion. That, okay, why, why are some of the, you know, why do things behave this the way they are? And these are the drivers, right? Whether you can actually predict it using these drivers, that's a different story. But when you're doing technical, and I hope you remember that you know, things will never con con uh, contradict fundamentals in the long term. And that it has to come down. And so the other, uh, so the, the present value analysis, so this is uh, the, the second method we're going to talk about uh, conceptually. It's really quite simple. It's, it takes a, so before the relative, we're using earnings right, as, a, as, a, as a guide. You can also use revenues if the company is, is a tech company that doesn't have net income. So because some companies would have negative net income. And for tech firms, it's a different, so for social media, they, have, so they actually don't have net income or cash flow. So in that sense, you can use a, 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 a multiple of the users. So they, they say this all the time, right? How do you value Facebook? Well, maybe $2 per user, right? Or $10 a user, depending on how well as you use it. So this second method is saying, okay, let's use cash instead, because in finance, if you have to take some finance courses, cash is what's, what's, what really matters. So if a company, it's good you have.